What is up guys, from Sea to Stone here, and in this episode I'll be going over three important factors to growing bigger buds at home. I'll also show you other steps that I take to ensure success as this garden gets ready to transition into flower. This episode will be a little bit longer than usual, so make sure you're somewhere comfy, sit back, and enjoy. Quantum boards were easily one of the most requested lights for this season, and when poking around and doing my research and talking to a few other growers, one of the most recommended brands was Spider Farmer. Not only do they use high quality name brand parts, but they bring some of the best products to the market at incredibly competitive prices. This was my first time trying out one of their boards, and so far I'm blown away at the performance. Great internodal stacking, vigorous growth, and some of the healthiest plants that I've grown yet. After falling in love with the SF4000, I reached out to Spider Farmer to see if they wanted to sponsor a giveaway as a way to give back to my community. They loved the idea so much they decided to not only sponsor one giveaway, but to do two, and put up two of their SF4000 grow lights. The first giveaway will be hosted here on YouTube. There are multiple ways to enter, and a winner will be announced on January 1st. I should also note that it's 100% free to enter, and each option gives you one entry into the giveaway. The second giveaway is more like a contest that I'll be hosting on my personal Discord server. This contest will comprise of a solo cub grow off that will ultimately be voted on by the community. I'm also going to be throwing in some second and third place prizes as well. The details on this giveaway will be announced in the Discord on the 1st of December. I'll leave links to the YouTube giveaway away and my discord in the video's description. I don't know about you guys, but I'm a sucker for big buds. Who doesn't like to hold the giant nug? It's almost like a big old weed trophy. Not to mention, seeing a canopy filled with resin pack colas is really satisfying. Now although your significant others might disagree, bigger is not always better. Larger buds are more prone to encountering bud rot if your environment is not spot on, so this guide will show you key factors on how to grow bigger buds, but also teach you how to create and manage an environment to reduce some of those risks that can occur. In the last episode, I showed you guys how to create a base for the perfect canopy. I implemented multiple training techniques to force these gals to bush out and create a flood of new tops. However, in this episode, I'll be thinning out the plants almost completely and implementing some additional training methods to achieve an edge-to-edge -edge canopy that's ready for transition. As you can probably tell, these plants are incredibly thick, and although they do look healthy, these plants as they stand are not optimal to send into flower. In order to get them ready, I first need to spread out their canopy using a cheap tool called the scrogna. By installing a scrog net, not only will I be able to get some of these gaps closed, but I can also even out their canopy even further as two of my plants like to grow big and tall, and the other two grow consistent but at a much slower pace. It's optimal to have an even canopy as it helps ensure even light distribution, making it to where no buds tower over the rest, tainting a grow's overall efficiency. To start, I first need to get the plants into position. I'll be moving the two ladies on the right closer to the tent walls as they're not only shorter but haven't spread out as much. Because the two on the left have grown taller, my plan is to use the scrog net to flatten them out and make them more even with the rest of the garden. I will still be moving them slightly over as I don't want the branches smushed up against the tent walls. Next, I install four of the included metal brackets to each corner of my tent. I would always recommend opting for metal brackets as the plastic ones can snap due to the tension from the net. After the brackets are installed, I work corner by corner and attach the netting. It's important to note that typically for your first layer of netting, you want smaller squares than what you see here. However, this net is much thicker than most trellis netting and also has strong elastic properties. My reason for going with this net, even though it does have larger gaps, is I'm dealing with two fairly stubborn and large phenos. Because of the size difference, I'm really going to have to wrench down on these two plants in order to get them more even with the ones on the right. My fear was a thinner, less sturdy net might not be as effective as this stronger netting. It really will depend on your growth specifically. Once the net is installed, it's time for me to start lowering the brackets and getting a rough leveling to the canopy. I work corner by corner until the net is low enough that it just touches the tops of the plants on the right and starts bending down the tops on the left. Now the process isn't done yet. In order to achieve the best results, I work top by top and tuck them under the netting as secure as I can get it. In some cases, these tops are making almost a full 45 degree bend. As long as the tops allow it though, this is perfectly fine. 
time. I'm also trying to not only level the canopy, but also spread it out as evenly across the tent as I can. So in some cases, I'll pull taller branches out to the edges while leaving the shorter ones more towards the middle. As you can probably see, I didn't really touch the ladies on the right. The reason for this is I want to continue to let those plants grow upwards while slightly stunning the two gals on the left. This should buy them some extra time to catch up before transition. Now I'm not gonna lie, at this point the canopy looks pretty mutilated, tops facing every which direction, and leaves being left overturned. It's almost like getting your hair cut by a barber who's blindfolded. Your hair is most likely gonna look jacked by the time they're finished. However, as we know, cannabis is a very resilient plant, and given the proper time to recover, should bounce back perfectly. Let's look at the difference that even 24 hours has on the garden. Even though the tops have sprung back and are now right side up, the left side is still noticeably taller than the right. So over the next few days, I'll continue to go top by top and retuck them as needed in order to get a more consistent result. Similar as before, I take the tallest tops and continue to stretch them out towards the edge of the canopy. And I'll be leaving the shorter tops more towards the center. Three days after beginning the training, our canopy is now really starting to take shape. Looking at this side shot, it really shows how a scrog net can manipulate a branch to spread out the canopy. This lady in the front has almost matched the same height as the rest, and even our slowest pheno in the back has started to catch up too. I might do a little bit more work with their tops in the coming week, however for the most part their initial scrog net training is complete. Now so far I've talked a lot about the upper canopy, however one of the most crucial steps to growing bigger buds and increasing your overall yields lies within how one manages the lower canopy. As the plants sit now, their undergrowth is overdeveloped and incredibly bushy. This not only increases the chances of acquiring pest and mold, however if flipped now the plants would divert their energy into developing buds that ultimately will not bulk up to size and will most likely be underdeveloped due to improper exposure to light. What's the remedy for this? Come on, Boogie, let's burn this motherfucker down! Okay, all jokes aside, the easiest way to manage the lower canopy is through a technique called lollipopping. Lollipopping is the process of removing the leaves and small auxiliary branches from under the canopy. You see, although plants have a natural instinct to grow upwards, especially to branches properly exposed to light, cannabis can still be inefficient with its energy management, and in turn, it will still try to produce buds to improperly exposed growth sites. The end result is a plant filled with tiny, undesirable popcorn nugs that will most likely be underdeveloped due to a lack of light. Instead, we can force the plant to put all of its energy into the upper canopy, giving us better yields and you guessed it, bigger buds. To start, I create an invisible line in my head where I want the new lower canopy to start. Everything under that line in terms of leaves will get removed. In addition to the leaves, I'm also removing auxiliary offshoots that either one, will not reach the top of the canopy come time for flower, or two, are so thin that the buds that they'd produce would be minuscule. I'm working plant by plant until I have a rough idea of how much is removed. And then after, I work from not only the bottom, but also the upper canopy to remove the remaining tops that I do not plan to flower. Remember, sometimes less is more. This time around, I was a lot more liberal in my stripping as the plants will continue to grow during the next few weeks in transition and pre-flower. Here's a shot of my yard waste bag so you can get an idea of how much I took off of just these four plants. With this training, our canopy will shoot upwards, creating nice hardy branches for our colas to form on. Lowly popping also has the added benefits of allowing air to freely pass under the canopy, bringing more oxygen to your root zones, reducing the chance of getting pest or PM, and lastly, reduces the chance of bud rot forming in the later stages of flower. I can't stress enough how important proper airflow is to your growth space. The amount of people that I see bringing me photos of bud rot or powdery mildew is insane. I typically like fans on both the lower and upper canopy and most of my grows will feature at least two to three fans minimum. Another important tip in growing bigger buds is making sure that you have proper light intensity throughout your grow space. Spider Farmer says a single SF4000 can flower a 5x5 grow space, and although I think that's possible, I don't think it will do it effectively after reviewing their graphs and cross-referencing them with other tests that I've seen on the internet. I'm trying to fill up this 5x5 as much as possible, so I ended up adding in another SF2000 to get a more consistent spread in flower. I hoisted 
boosted both lights up as high as I could get them and I turned their intensity as low as possible. The reason for this is I do not want to shock the plants because of the increase in light. Throughout transition, I'll slowly lower the lights per the manufacturer's recommendations and raise the light intensity as needed. Too much light can cause issues with your plants at multiple levels, however if introduced properly can yield great results. Now that transition is just a few days away, I need to further prepare my environment for flower. I mentioned before that the larger colas can be prone to bud rot, and outside of proper airflow as mentioned earlier, one of the most important conditions is your humidity levels. I'll be removing the humidifier from my tent in hopes to get the RH to about 55 during transition, and once flower begins, I'll aim for about 50% and under. If needed, I'll add a dehumidifier to help ensure the level stays consistent as larger plants tend to raise the RH considerably. The next thing I need to do this week to prepare for transition is to install a second layer of trellis netting. Why add another layer you might ask? Well the first net was installed to spread out the canopy, however, once transition, the plants will naturally start their pre-flower stretch. This is the stage where all of the tops will drastically shoot up and eventually start creating their colas. Depending on how much they stretch and how big our buds get, this second layer of trellis netting will help support their buds ensuring that they don't flop over and break their stems. Unlike the first layer, I won't be pushing the netting down to canopy level. Instead, I'll be leaving a good 5 to 6 inches between the top of the canopy and the netting. This is to allow space for the tops to stretch and once they do, I'll adjust if needed. A good example of what can happen without netting can be seen in my CBD cream and cheese grow. Because I didn't have netting installed, I had a bunch of colas flopped over due to their weight, I ended up having to ghetto rig the grow to hold it up. So my recommendation is, if you're going to be growing larger plants, definitely consider some kind of netting or something to support the buds. If there's one thing that I've learned in my years of growing, it's better to take preventative action rather than waiting for a problem to arise. The last thing I'll be doing prior to changing their light cycle to 12 hours on and 12 hours off in order to induce flowering is adjust their feed. For this grow, I've been testing out Sugar Peak by Earth Juice. So far, I've been pretty impressed with the results. Earth Juice is a one part per stage nutrient lineup that is a nice blend between natural and synthetic ingredients. Sugar Peak has a specific nutrient for the transition stage. The reason for this is as the plants mature and prepare for flower, it requires different nutrients along the way. In fact, each stage of its life cycle, certain nutrients won't be as pertinent, while other nutrients that haven't yet been introduced become a necessity. The purpose of Sugar Peak's transition is to better aid the plant in the transformation from veg to bloom. It slowly starts cutting out some of the key veg nutrients while introducing small doses of nutrients key to having a successful flower. This can greatly reduce the stress on a plant and prepare it for the coming environmental changes. I do want to let you guys know of some exciting news not related to the giveaway. Not only will I be starting the Space Bucket Grow featured previously for its start to finish grow summary video, but I'm also introducing a new budget tent here in the coming weeks. What does that mean for you? Well, as I mentioned before, the reason my videos are more spaced out is I wanted to have more content focused videos that had some real substance to them. I found that reaching a weekly video quota left some of the videos dry when there wasn't that much going on in the garden. But now that I'm introducing another budget tent into the mix, means I'll be posting a completely separate series here on YouTube. It will take place as its own separate grow and in its own video series. That means that I'll be uploading more frequently while still retaining higher quality videos, which is a win-win for us both. I'm due to start this grow in just a few weeks, so stay tuned. Overall, I'm really happy with this grow. I haven't ran into any major hiccups other than some stubborn phenos. This finished canopy marks the next chapter in this grow, and it's time to start filling this tent with some bud. Peyote Wi-Fi has a high chance of not only turning purple, but is known for stacking on a ton of trichomes. This leaves it with a jaw-dropping frosty appearance, not to mention a beautiful color. Outside of Peyote Gorilla, in my opinion, it's one of the strongest introductions to the Seedsman genetic lineup that I've seen thus far. I've put in all this work, and it's now time to see the fruits of our labor. In the 
coming weeks, we'll see the buds start to fill this tent from edge to edge, and to say that I was excited would be an understatement. Before I go, I want to let you guys know that every product used is linked in the video's description. I also started adding chapters to my videos this season, so if you guys ever feel overwhelmed with information, you can pause and go back to answer your questions a lot easier. Lastly, this channel is supported majorly by Patreon. For those who don't know, because of the nature of my content, I'm unable to monetize my videos, meaning I make absolutely nothing from YouTube directly. However, if you want to support the channel, or even get one-on-one -on -one help with growing and other exclusive content, consider joining the Patreon community, which can be found at patreon.com forward slash from seed to stone. Now that the season is relaunched, I'll be doing private live streams for members again, as well as giving sneak peeks at the Space Bucket Grow. If you guys enjoyed the video, press the thumbs up button below. And don't forget to comment letting me know what your thoughts were on the video or just say hi. It's one of the best ways to support the channel outside of Patreon and only takes a few seconds out of your day. I'll be seeing you guys in the next installment of From Sea to Stone, and as always guys, happy growing.